Hello, everybody. My name is Lisa Superbox. Welcome back to my podcast, The Way I See It. So I'm actually recording this one in advance because I am going away on vacation, um, going away with husband to Turkey. We're going to do a couple of days in Cappadocia, uh, exploring kind of caves and seeing the balloons. And then we are off to Antalya to lie down in the sun and just a observe some, like absorb some warmth and some vitamin d because right now in the uk it's been six months of pretty much gray and rain and so i am done so yeah very excited for that so i'm recording this one in advance but and you know i would have taken a week normally i do but i really felt like this was something that people need to hear right now so i wanted to get this out to you guys and i did mention in last week's podcast that i was going to include a section on em- being an empath and it just we're already 25 minutes in after talking about independence and i thought i know i will give it a time of its own so first things first let's talk about what it means to be an empath now there are lots of different definitions i mean literally i i can just literally in front of me there are hundreds there are sometimes people say there's nine some people say there's 10 some people say there's seven let's start with the three types of empath so the first is an emotional empath. So this is somebody, and I think this is what people most commonly mean, is they are attuned to the emotions of others. So that means they feel how other people feel on a deep inner level. It's like beyond just kind of going, oh, I can imagine how you feel. Like they deeply feel their grief. They deeply feel their emotions. And I think when most people say they're an empath, this is what they really mean. The second would be physical. So you might feel physical symptomology in your body. So let's say if someone else is sick, you might even get like those mirror symptoms. And again, could be mirror neurons, could definitely be, you know, physical empathy. And the third one is an intuitive empath. And so this is really just a a bigger sense of perception, an innate sense of knowing something broader, just this kind of sense of being, of kind of knowing what's going on without actually knowing what's going on. And so for the purpose of today's conversation, let's talk about those three. Now, obviously they break down even further, like you can list out, you know, an animal empath, a plant empath you know, you can break down a medical empath. So they're kind of more focused on healing. Um, Someone's got one, you know, it's one called geomantic, I think it's called. So it's the environment. There's so many ways you could break this down. And there is a really, really rare form of empath called a Hayoka empath or Hayoki empath. And this is somebody that almost actually is almost like your shadow. So they'll basically, let's say that I go to them and I've got some trauma wounds around uh, being seen they might be really triggering for me because they wouldn't necessarily know they were doing it. They just actually reflect back to me all the things I don't like about myself in order to process them. So guys, honestly, when I say empath is not, you know, people say, oh, I'm an empath. I'm like, oh yeah, because it, it like, it has many nuances to it. But for the purpose of today's conversation, let's talk about emotional, physical, and intuitive. Now, I am definitely an intuitive empath. So I don't have, I'm not an emotional empath. So by that, I mean, I'm not, if someone else is upset, I don't jump into the upset with them. I might feel the overwhelming sense of sadness or grief, but I'm able to really create a boundary around that. At least that's something I've been able to do more recently. But mine definitely comes from this sense of being able to anything around me, I'm heavily influenced by anything around me. And because my perception of the world and how I see the world and my intuition is my primary driver for everything in life, in business, in my sense of authenticity and my sense of happiness in who I believe I am, like I often find (laughs) that if I, let's say, watch a scary movie, I'm like that, oh God, and I can't sleep. And it's not because I've taken on the story as my own. It's not, well, that was actually, you know, I'm gonna tell you about that in a second. That was something I used to do when I was coaching take on a lot of stories it's not so much that I believe that story is my own it's that it interferes with my sense of being able to make sense of the world it interferes with my sense of intuition it interferes with my sense of knowing and feeling and being able to trust myself when I have all these things in my environment that are negative now I've talked a lot on this podcast about nervous system and nervous system sensitivity and nervous system dysregulation now Someone who's in nervous system dysregulation also is going to be more intolerable to things like scary movies, to things like negativity, to things like because of the fact that they are highly sensitive in their nervous system because they're dysregulated or they're dysregulated because they have a highly sensitive nervous system. So if you are on that end of the spectrum of sensitivity, so you're all the way left, let's say it was left and right and super sensitive is left. If you're all the way left in your sensitivity, And let's say you've been through stress, your nervous system is chronically stressed. And if you don't know what that means, please go back, listen to my previous podcast. But a nervous system in dysregulation means it's not able to move 
from our react to our relax system, it's stuck in our react system. If you are there, then your ability to be in touch with your intuition, your ability to be in touch with you know, your sense of self, your authenticity, your power is going to be dysregulated. And so then when we throw into the mix, negativity, noise, politics, scary films, you know, we then create this monster of actually just taking on everything in the world around us and actually not being able to process it and not trust ourselves. And so this is why a lot of people label themselves as empathic, because actually they just take on way too much from the environment around them. But that could be because of their nervous system and the state of their nervous system. So being sensitive and being dysregulated. So for me personally, I am someone now who is much more in regulation than dysregulation. Of course, there's times where I'm sure I get stuck there after a, a hyperactive day or a day where I've been working too hard. I get stuck on the other end. But I am an intuitive empath. So I know that if I'm not in touch with my intuition, then I'm going to feel dysregulated because I'm not in touch with who I know I am. And so really working out where you take on other people's stuff is really powerful for knowing, actually, is it I'm more intuitive? Am I more emotional? Am I more physical? And the question, and this is one of the big things that I really believe has changed the game for me, is where do I need to create boundaries so that I can still live my life? Because being an empath doesn't have to be a kryptonite. It absolutely does not. But if you are somebody that is in nervous system dysregulation, you're already in kryptonite, right? And then you're doing all these other things with no boundaries. So your kryptonite as someone who is an empath in any form is number one, a lack of boundaries. And number two, if you are someone in nervous system dysregulation, your empathic abilities are not only squished, right? But also you're going to be burnt out and exhausted all the time. So if you are an empathic person, if you've listened to this, because you're like, yeah, I think I'm an empath. First of all, let's get really clear. What is it you're empathic about? Is it that you, you know, you really feel other people's feelings? Is it that you know what people need ahead of time? Is it that you physically sense things going on or you can physically feel how someone feels? I like get sympathy pains, they used to call it, right? What, what type of empath are you? And then look at where do you get most impacted? So do you get most impacted when you're in a certain group of people? Is there a certain environment that throws you off? Is there a certain place that throws you off? And work out where am I being affected, not positively. So just because you're an empath doesn't mean it's always a negative thing if you're impacted. It actually means that if you are an empath and you are impacted positively, then you are more likely to create change because your nervous system and your sensitivity has more bend and flex. So if you are somebody that actually is really sensitive and someone who does have that like high level of, whether it's intu intuition, emotion, or physical adaption, like you're spongy, let's call it that, you're spongy, right? Then actually what that means is you're also predisposed to positive change in the right environments. So your first step is to work out where in your environments is it negative? Where in my environments do I need to create more boundaries? And the, what do those boundaries look like? Is it that you're scrolling Instagram and it makes you feel insignificant. So there's a boundary there, stop scrolling Instagram or set a 10 minute timer on your phone. You know, where is, is there a boundary you need to set around other people that when I'm around my friend, she just first half an hour is fun and then she just gets droning and droning and droning. So where can I limit the ability for us to talk to half an hour? I know what we'll do, we'll walk to the gym, have a workout where we're, you know, with a PT and then we'll walk back maximum half an hour. Like where can you create some practical boundaries around let environments that don't serve you positively and then secondly where can you dial up environments that do serve you positively what do you listen to or absorb that raises you up that lifts you up what are you consuming now the one flip side to this is that often empaths can become like radical consumers because we're sponges we often just think well the more i consume the better but what that actually does can actually cause nervous system dysregulation because it causes us to not be able to sort our thoughts sort our decisions, sort our beliefs. And if you have any kind of wounding around not feeling good enough and believing that other people, you know, know more than you, then you're always going to be consuming too much. And then you're going to be in that indecision, that paralysis, you're not going to be able to move forward. So I always suggest to all of my clients is to just pick one thing that you're going to listen to for that month or that period of time in line with whatever goals you might have and make that your Bible. So make that your Bible to listen to and maybe to read as well. If you like to do both, and then to choose one strategy for your personal growth and focus on that for a short period of time, because actually, otherwise we kind of can get dysregulated from doing too many things. Now to throw ADHD in the mix here, and I do believe there is a massive link between ADHD, empath 
being an empath and nervous system sensitivity and dysregulation. I believe all three are massively connected from everything I've been through and everything I've studied. So if you throw neurodiversity into the mix, the, the, the desire to be pulled in 17 directions and the ability to be distracted is immense, right? If we're talking about ADHD, the ability to hyper-focus or obsess, if we're talking about other types of neurodiversity, is also there. And I do believe that nervous system sensitivity through neurodiversity and empathy and being an empath are massively connected. So your job then is to work out where am I hyper-focusing and burning myself out? Because there's a boundary there. Where am I getting distracted and losing sense of myself and losing sense of my purpose? Because there's a boundary that needs to be there. Where am I somebody that's being pulled in 17 directions? What boundaries do we need to put in place? So that's the first thing is if you are an empath of any kind, if you have ADHD, if you have neurodiversity, if you have nervous system sensitivity or dysregulation, your number one priority and focus is boundaries. Here is the reason people do not have or set boundaries. One, societal expectation. Two, cultural conditioning. And three, if we have any kind of belief that we're not good enough, we will always put other people's expectations, desires, and their boundaries ahead of our own. Fact. So it's really difficult when I sit here and say, you just need to put in a boundary. You'll be like, no, not as easy as that. So we have to take a step back. There is a piece that we have to work on behind our empathy, behind our ADHD, behind our nervous system sensitivity, that should be our primary focus if we want to avoid burnout, avoid being drained, and avoid being the person who is just constantly absorbing all this negative stuff around them. And that is we have to work on nervous system regulation because everything is layered, right? So your, uh, your empathy is creating nervous system dysregulation, but your nervous system dysregulation is creating your empathy. If you've got neurodiversity, your neurodiversity is creating your empathy, but it's also potentially creating your nervous system dysregulation. Your nervous system dysregulation is making your neurodiversity more problematic and your empathy is making your, ne your neurodiversity more problematic. So it's a triangle, right? And everything's feeding. But the foundation to it all is if you can do the work to regulate the nervous system, to bring regulation to the body. So to bring your body and your nervous system out of a state of react all the time, or even in numbness, right? If you've moved into numbness now, and into the actual relax, the actual calm, the actual safe system where you feel safe in body, safe in mind, safe in emotions. If you can bring that and make that happen, and it isn't one meditation, it isn't one breath work. I'm sorry. I wish it was. I wish I could sit here and tell you I did it overnight or in one therapy session. It's just not how it looks. But when we can bring that stability to the nervous system, that safety, that calmness, what we then do is bring that safety and calmness to a sense of self. Our sense of self is then able to still harness those empathic abilities, but not necessarily let them overwhelm us. We're also in a situation where we can harness our neurodiversity. You know, and I'm talking about mine specifically and the clients that I've worked with who are mainly ADHD. So we're working to manage our energy levels, to manage our blood sugar, to manage our, um, you know, our hormones. And we're doing all these things so that when the hyper focus kicks in, we can harness it. And when the executive dysfunction kicks in, it doesn't matter because we're harnessing it the rest of the time. So the key here is, and I'm doing this image, if you're watching a video, like, a, like almost like holding a circle and turning it, this sense of stability and safety is foundational in, you know, harnessing our empathy, but also if you have ADHD in kind of helping regulate and manage that. So there is always a bridge to cross and your bridge might look different to mine. My bridge to harnessing my ADHD and harnessing my empathy and my intuition has massively been focused around my nervous system. So yours might be something else. You might feel the need that you actually want to go take medication as a first step to help regulate that so you can do the nervous system work. And I'm a massive believer in building a bridge and everyone's bridge looks different. So when we bring that stability to the nervous system and that safety, we open up room for our intuition the noise, the crazy thoughts and the noise in our head starts to slow down so we can start to discern the difference between the chitter chatter, blah, 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 blah. And hey, we're going to go left, which is the voice of the higher self. And so when we do this work to regulate the nervous system, we then create space to heal on a mental and emotional level. And at that point, then we can start to stepping into harnessing our empathic abilities to then hold ourselves back from being burnt out by negative politics or watching scary movies and look I still don't want to watch scary movies and watch the news that's never going to be a thing for me <laughs> but the truth is I can handle it 
I can handle it because I've brought regulation to my nervous system. I work on harnessing my neurodiversity that makes my sensitivity worse. And because I've healed the stories from my past that were keeping my nervous system in dysregulation. I've healed the stories of my past that were keeping me stuck in ideologies about who I had to be, a lack of boundaries, that I had to work harder, I had to be do more, I had to be a high performer. Because all those kind of things are things that we can heal from. And let me tell you, as somebody who has bounced back from burnout twice, hopefully never have to do it for the third time. This time has really worked to bring regulation to my nervous system and I'm still working on it. I've reversed biology in blood tests, which is just amazing. I've brought myself off the rocks in. I've balanced my hormones, although I'm a little early swing of perimenopause right now. I'm bringing balance to that, you know, on a kind of regular basis. And what then has happened is I'm actually able to trust myself to make decisions about my work, my business, who I speak to, what my email's about, what my podcast's about. And that trust is leading me in a situation where I'm earning more money than I've ever earned before, you know, from doing less, from being in a situation where I'm just moving with that inspired action. And I can move with that inspiration because I trust the voice of my higher self, because that voice is my intuitive empath, is the one that has, is wired to have a sense of perception of the world around me. And it's because I'm not caught up in the chatter of my mind, the opinions and like kind of objectives of other people, but also because I'm not caught up in the chronic stress of nervous system dysregulation. There is room for me to be an empath, to tap into my empathic abilities, for that to make me an excellent coach, a good friend, a good mentor, someone who loves what they do and actually thrive. So I hope you've loved this episode. It was a bit random, but I've really felt like I need to share it with you. So if you've loved it, I'd love for you to drop me a comment. I'd also love a little review. It takes two seconds if you're on podcast or Apple just to drop a little um, star rating. And if you want to drop a comment, that's amazing too. And do not forget, if you want to get the free masterclass on how to make that lifelong transformation, the three barriers that are holding you back from bringing yourself back from burnout, bringing yourself into regulation, bringing yourself into calm and harnessing and becoming that next level version of you, then you can get the free masterclass at lucysuperfox.com forward slash transformation. And if right now you're looking for that one-to-one accountability and support, you can unlock my one-to-one coaching program at lucysuperfox.com forward slash coaching. It's at the top. It's a monthly mindset membership. There's only a two week cancellation fee and there's no minimum term. So if you want to work with me, you unlock two calls a month with me, plus homework, plus resources added to the back end. So if you love this episode, don't forget to leave me a little review. If you want to work with me, you've had the links. I'll pop them in the show notes below. And otherwise, I will see you on the next episode.